spherical waves and link budgets. This is really the most practical way to track power in a radio system. Ultimately, what we're using our field theory and our link budgets for is to figure out how much power gets from point A to point B in a radio link. In this case, in, our, in the case of satellite communications, this is going to be from point A, satellite number one, to satellite number two, or satellite number one to the Earth station, or from Earth station up to a satellite. So those are basically the, the physical scenarios that we're trying to track power. And power is the most important thing in any communication link. People talk about modulation. People talk about channel impairments like frequency selectivity, how much it wiggles around in the frequency domain, how much dispersion you get, how much time variation. Power, though, is the showstopper. It's, it's everything in communications. So perhaps it would be a good time to uh, uh, do a little informal survey. This, this is a philosophical question. What is the most important equation? You could waste a lot of beer and a lot of arguments with your fellow grad students about this. But what is the most, in your, in your view, there's no right answer to this. Let's get some examples. So let's figure out, we'll figure out the cross-section of the class. Like, like what's, where philosophically is this varied class coming from many walks of EE and not EE? Where are y'all coming from? Nick, what's your favorite equation? You can't, you love them all. That is such a cop-out. Evan, bail out your, your Oh, I don't know. Euler's equation? So oh, very mathematical, my friend. That one always, uh, Euler's equation. And the specific example of that, too, this was probably the most mind-blowing equation when I first got to college. Like, somebody put e to the pi i is equal to negative 1. I was like, what the heck are you talking about? There are three completely different things that I learned in high school, and you're saying they're all related? This natural logarithm constant, constant which came up in, like, continuous uh, in compounding interest equation or something that I learned in high school. And there's this geomet geometrical factor of a circle, pi, Pi, pi r times 2 is the diameter. And then you got this imaginary number, which they taught me in high school. I didn't know why the heck I was being lear learning about imaginary numbers. And then they were all related. So Euler's form, which, of course, is e to the jx is equal to cosine x plus j sine x. That's certainly one of the most useful ones to electrical engineers because it's the the essence of the phasor domain and the phasor transform. Anyone else? Anyone else? A bit, huh? Ohm's law. Ohm's law. Ohm's law. That's a good engineering, electrical engineering answer. I suspect that you know how to build circuits in the back if that's your favorite equation. V equals IR. In fact, there's a funny story on the um, uh, core cadet. No, what is it? Uh, Army Corps of Engineers uh, certification exam, there was a question that said, what is the most important law? What are the three most fundamental laws of electrical engineering? And the answer was this. The first one was V equals IR. The second one was I equals V over R. <laughs> and the third one was R equals V over I. So clearly, they would have thought as you do, three times over. Any, anyone else? OK, I will answer for you, because you're in a, an airspace. The Navier-Stokes equation. Oh, no, no, you're not that kind of like, uh, an aeronautical engineer. Give me an, a, 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 what is your favorite equation, or most important one in your field? I guess just two body gravitation, negative over Oh, wow, you really are space guys. Yeah, that's awesome. OK, Newtonian gravitation. Uh, did, did, was there somebody else here? Yeah, equals MC. Oh, equals MC squared. The guy is obviously designing a nuclear reactor. Good, good. Philosophically, that's very impactful, though, right? Mass is the same thing as energy. 
I don't use that one very often in my day-to-day -day life as a professor, but. Okay, this is an electrical engineering class being taught by an electromagnetics professor. I'm really shocked and a little disappointed that somebody has not mentioned a set of four vector calculus equations. Oh, yeah, oh, oh, I didn't, that's a good example, that's a good, I like that. It's only the funda foundation of electrical engineering. Nothing happens electrically without these. Anyone else? The Fourier transform. A good math, that's a, up here in the mathematical sphere, right? Fourier transforms. Clearly, you're one of those DSP types. Okay. Anyone else? Anyone else? I put this on the board. There's no right answer to this. I once went to a, a talk at Virginia Tech, my alma mater, when I was a student. It was a, a Nobel laureate was coming to visit. It was one of the only ones that actually did his undergrad at Virginia Tech, and so I was excited. We went to his talk, and I forget what branch of physics he went into. He said, what's the most important equation, he said, up there? He said, if you ask me, it would be the Clausius Clapeyron equation. <laughs> of course, the rest of us are going, huh? But of course, I, had, I knew what he was talking about because I had uh, uh, taken some thermo courses on the side just because I was nuts. And uh, that Clausius Clapeyron equation, if you remember your phase diagrams, uh, where you have like temperature and pressure here, and in a phase diagram, you have a region where if the temperature is high enough and the pressure is low enough, you think your substance is a gas. And then up here, it's a solid. And down here, uh, it's a, well, no, this is liquid. And over here, it's a solid. And you can have other phase changes as well. Every substance has a diagram like this, right? <coughs> Clausius Clapeyron equation says basically the energy that you get from going from a liquid to a gas is related to the slope, or pro equal to the slope of that line. Why is that the most important equation? We actually had a really good point. He says this basically tells you how much energy is going to... Um, come out of a, of a phase change from water, uh, liquid water, to steam or, or uh, gas water. So in effect, it was the equation of the Industrial Revolution, right? This is how you made your first engines work and figured out how much energy was going to come out of them and how efficient they would operate. In fact, he even said that he went to Virginia Tech in mechanical engineering back in the 60s. Even back then, there were, I'm sure there was a comparable class here at Georgia Tech there was a cl uh, class called STEAM that every, en every engineer had to take. You imagine that nowadays going home and say, oh, what did you take this semester? STEAM. But I, I wasn't any different because uh, my, my, my parents would ask me when I came home from undergraduate, it's like, what did you learn this semester? What was your favorite class? I said, oh, fields. They said, fields? Like rolling hills kind of fields? I said, no, 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 no. Electromagnetic fields. Uh oh. They'd come back the next semester. And they said, What was your favorite class? I said, Waves. Waves? Like at the beach? There's no electromagnetic waves. Uh oh. So they probably thought they were they're getting a very good deal with their college tuition. Ah. So these are all great answers, fine answers. There's another one that I'm surprised that the electrical engineers have not put up. I will put up one form of this. What equation is that? Has anyone seen that one? Ah, yeah, this is a beautiful one. This is the Shannon Channel Capacity Theorem. This is bandwidth, B. This is capacity in bits per second. And this is signal to noise, so the ratio of signal power to noise power. 
And this basically tells you this is the speed of light for information effectively. If you have this much signal power in the presence of this much noise power and this much bandwidth, you will never, ever, ever get more than so many bits per second out of that channel reliably. If you stay below that limit, though, mathematically speaking, you can get those bits perfectly. The interesting thing about the Shannon Channel Capacity Theorem is that it does not tell you how to get to that limit. That's what the entire field of telecommunications engineering is based on. But you at least know, unlike many of our other fields, it, sending bits per second over a channel is a closed form problem. You know when you've got the right answer, because that's the right answer. You know when you've gotten close. This is why, in many ways, telecommunications engineers over the years have almost put themselves out of business. 20 years ago, we couldn't get close to the Shannon Channel Capacity Theorem. Now, with all the fancy forward error correction coding and modulation techniques, we're getting maddeningly close within a dB or two in a realistic system. So that's wonderful, but it also means that, to an extent, uh, we've, we've, limit, we've run into some limits of what you can call physical layer research and telecommunications. It's been a commoditized problem that we know we know the right answers to. We, we have enough tools in our uh, toolbox to get to this answer. And this answer does not depend on anything about your signal other than power. And that's really the takeaway that I want you to, to gather. So what we're going to be doing the rest of this lecture and then some of the next, is to pinpoint the power, to track power from point A to point B, because ultimately that will be what determines how many bits per second we can send on a radio link. We'll also then, after that, we'll spend some time talking about how to calculate noise and where it comes from and how to quantify it. And that will be the missing piece of that equation, too. And we'll really ultimately understand the physical sensitivity of our RF systems really the physical sensitivity of any radio system, not just satellites. So it'll be a really useful lecture, I think, for your, the practicing engineer uh, these next few uh, class periods. So let's go back then with this in mind to the idea of a spherical wave. I am going to put the general form of a spherical wave. It looks strikingly similar to a plane wave with just a few modifications. This is what a spherical wave looks like. The electric field has an amplitude that is allowed to vary with respect to theta and phi. You divide it by r over lambda. So it says units of volts per meter. This is unitless. <coughs> and then the spherical wave formula, the direction of propagation, what we called k hat, is always r hat, away from the origin. We put our source at the origin, and then we watch the wave propagate away from it. So that's why this is an r hat. But otherwise, everything is the same. This is the wave number, 2 pi over lambda. This is the amplitude of the wave. And now we have a geometrical spreading factor of r over lambda. h is exactly the same thing. It is e naught, which is allowed to vary with respect to theta and phi without violating Math Maxwell's equations. You can put variation in there, and it won't violate Maxwell's equation. It is also has the same geometrical spreading factor and, of course, has an impedance in the denominator, an eta. H hat there, it has a polarization, and then it has the exact same phase propagating term. Now, I've written everything theta and phi, and if you want to count distance r away from the origin. I'm using the spherical coordinate system. Just for a refresher, this is the electromagnetics convention that we're using, where a point of observation r, theta, and phi, 
R is the distance to the origin. Phi is the azimuth angle. If I drop this down and project it onto the xy plane, the angle that that projection makes with the x-axis is phi. And theta in electromagnetics is the elevation angle as measured from the z-axis. Zero is straight up. 90 degrees is on the horizon, reversed from how the, we did it in look angles. But that's just the way conventions work. Now, most of your physics textbooks, for example, are probably switched. Theta is azimuth, and phi is elevation. And rho is often the, uh, the variable that you use instead of r in the spherical coordinate system. Everything is reversed in electrical engineering. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But everything works the same way. If we wanted to calculate a pointing vector from a spherical wave, we could do it. We could do it like this. We take the same S average is equal to one half the real value of my E vector phasor times my H vector phasor. And when I put these together, one half real value, I got E naught over R lambda times E, E, X, B minus J, K, R hat dotted with respect to R, cross E naught, R over lambda, eta, Z H hat, E, X, B minus J, K, R hat dotted with respect to R. I got to take a complex conjugate of my H field. How do I do that? I just complex conjugate everything that's being multiplied together. These are all real value, so I don't have to worry about that. I got an H complex conjugate, and I complex conjugate a complex exponential by just flipping the sign on the J. Now, I multiply this all through. First of all, these are real constants, so I can pull them out. So I get E naught squared, which of course, not to forget, is a function of angle of arrival. Two, I get R over lambda squared, What's left over? I got an EXP minus JK something uh, scalar quantity multiplied by the exact same thing with a plus. So when I multiply those th two things together, I get EDXP to the zero. That's one. That simplifies. So really all I have left is the real value of my E crossed into H complex conjugate for the uniform plane wave, we had an expression for this. It's actually valid for the uniform spherical wave as well, or not non-uniform spherical wave. What was that equal to? That's equal to the direction of propagation. In this case, it's r hat. The real value of r hat is just r hat. And we wind up getting this nice expression for the, oh, and we have to have an eta there too. Yeah, there's an eta we got to pull out as well. E squared over eta to R over lambda quantity squared in the R direction. Power is being propagated away from the origin where ultimately we're going to put an antenna to radiate. And this expression tells me how many watts per meter squared I am sending information. Okay. Okay. Good, good. We're moving right along. Now, the real trick with an antenna is figuring out what this theta and phi dependence is in terms of power. Everything should be starting to look intuitively familiar, right? It's a little weird to think of E fields falling off 1 over R because we're trained to think in terms of power, right? And we know power is conserved in this system. If something's spreading out in three-dimensional spaces, it should be falling off 1 over r squared. But when you multiply the e and the h together, you get 1 over r squared. There's no such thing as conservation of field. 
field can fall off 1 over r. But when you do the pointing vector, you should get something that falls off 1 over r squared. <coughs> and that's just spatial spreading in three dimensions. But we still have to resolve the theta and the phi. Now, one quick comment. And I think this is a sample homework problem on the online course. If you go to that page on the website, um, it asks you, does this satisfy Maxwell's equations? You've got to go through and show that it does. And it turns out that this formula is only approximately Maxwellian. When you're very close to the origin, there are extra terms that you have to take into account. As soon as you move a couple wavelengths, a couple lambdas away, this is essentially a, uh, a solution to Maxwell's equations. That's not true of the uniform plane wave, which is exactly a solution of the plane wave. So if you're an EMAG nerd um, and you, you haven't taken Dr. Peterson's uh, EMAG class uh, yet, or even if you have, you can go home and kind of work that issue out in the privacy of your own home. Kind of study the nuances of wave propagation. Always a valuable thing to do. Okay. So... This is going to be the form of the pointing vector for any radiated wave. This spatial dependency, this angular dependency in theta and phi, is going to be a function of the type of antenna that's radiating this field solution. Now, if you go to an antenna spec sheet, you do not get E as a function of theta and phi. There's no plot on an antenna spec sheet that will tell you that. What they do tell you is usually gain as a function of theta and phi, or at least a cut of it. Since three dimensions, it's kind of unwieldy to plot in, on a piece of paper. On a spec sheet, you can at least get a, a cut of the gain. And uh, that, that is what we'll, we'll, we'll be working with. So how do you adjust this form of the equation so that you can use gain? Well, the first thing is, how do you define gain? So from a transmitter's perspective, here's how we define gain. Gain is always defined, hmm, I shouldn't say always, in this class and most sane human beings, always define gain with respect to what's called an isotropic radiator. So here's that fancy word that he threw out again. Isotropic, same in all directions. And this is just, let's do a little mental exercise. Let's say I have an antenna that's transmitting, and I put PT into it. This is my transmit power. If this was an isotropic radiator, it radiated power in every direction. And what's more, if it was an ideal isotropic radiator, and that is, None of this power was lost in and around the antenna itself. There would be no ohmic losses or dielectric losses or such. All that power went into the antenna, and 100% of it was radiated out uniformly in all directions. Well, we could come up with a pointing vector for that scenario as a function of your point of observation. It would not depend on theta and phi because by definition it's isotropic. And by conservation of power, I would expect to basically distribute that power P sub T uniformly over the surface of a sphere. If you're, that sphere is R away from the origin, the location of this radiator, then 4 pi r squared is the total area over that sphere. So if I divide P sub t by the total area, that should give me the magnitude of the pointing vector in watts per meter squared. So if I integrated all of that up across 4 pi star radians across the sphere of size r, I would get P sub t, conservation of power. And of course, the direction of propagation is r hat. And so we define gain... as the magnitude of S average compared to 
I would put an R in here, S-ISO. What is the actual power relative to an isotropic power? And so that means if I plug in my expressions here, uh, what I get is 2 pi The r squareds will cancel, and what I am left with is a lambda squared. Let's see, what else do I have? Two cancels with that, and I got an eta in the denominator, and then I got a p sub t. Is that right? Yeah, I think so. So let's see if I got the, the units right. That's Volts squared per meter squared. Meter squared, so I got volts squared. Volts squared is by, divided by ohms. That's power. Power divided by power. No units left. Gain is a unitless quantity. That's exactly how it should be. And so this is a helpful equation because it helps you relate the electromagnetics of what's going on, the E naught squared to whatever power that you've put into the antenna. So if somebody gives you a gain, say 10 dB, and more often than not, gain is reported in the decibel scale. You'll be very used to using the decibel scale by the time this class is over. 10 dB is a factor of 10 in the linear scale. That means that if I put one watt into there, I could put one watt here, and with these physical so constants, I could solve for what is the uh, peak field at that particular gain coming out of that antenna using this relationship. However, most RF engineers don't want to deal with electromagnetic quantities like field and magnetic field and all that. We want to deal strictly with respect to power. So. We have another definition of gain, and this one you're going to have to take on faith until we go ahead and prove it out later. Our other definition of gain is from a receiver perspective. And this is kind of like the problem that we worked earlier in the class. How do you define gain from a receiver perspective? Well, we said receivers, antennas, are kind of like cookie cutters in space. They grab energy out of uniform plane waves based on their electromagnetic aperture, or their effective aperture. So from a receiver point of view, My gain at the receiver is equal to 4 pi over lambda squared times the electromagnetic aperture. <coughs> Units of meter squared. So I have meter squared divided by meter squared, this wavelength is in here squared to basically cancel the meters. So again, we get a, a unitless quantity for gain. And this is from the receiver's perspective. This is the one that says antennas are kind of like cookie cutters in space. They have a, an effective aperture and area over which to gather energy. When a wave comes in and strikes that aperture, it collects that portion of watts per meter squared out of the pointing vector, grabs it, sends it out of an electrical port to a receiver. 4 pi lambda squared times that effective area is how you calculate gain from a receiver point of view. Now, here's the part that you'll have to take on faith until I show you a little bit later uh, in the course when we covered aperture antennas. Then it becomes a little more clear. But right now, it's going to seem like magic. It's going to be, this is one of the fundamental ideas in electromagnetism. It's called the reciprocity theorem. It basically says if I have an antenna, and I pump a piece of T in, and I look at its radiation pattern. And I go over and I calculate uh, uh, my transmitter gain by measuring field strength and how it varies with respect to theta and V. And 
look at the radiation relative to an isotropic radiator, I get a G sub T, a gain for the transmitter. If I take that same antenna and I measure the amount of power coming out of it for a given field strength excitation, I use this formula, the one that says, okay, I got a certain electromagnetic aperture. I'm going to take that aperture. I'm going to multiply it by the pointing vector, and that'll grab the energy out of it. And that's how I define gain from a receiver point of view. For the same antenna and the same bearing angle, those two definitions are exactly the same. You get the same number, whether the antenna is used in transmission or in reception one of the magical theorems in electromagnetics. It's called reciprocity. It doesn't matter how complex the environment is, how complex the field excitation is. The only thing you have to have is linearity. And for the most part, we have that in the majority of our RF lakes, with a few notable exceptions. Linearity is the only thing you need for reciprocity. This is what makes transmit and receive antenna gains the same in terms of their definition. So if that's true, we have enough actually now to calculate what our link budget is, and just enough time to do it, sans the examples. Let's say I have a link, a transmit antenna and a receiver antenna. I put power into my transmitter, and I'm expecting a cer certain amount of power at the receiver coming out of the spigot there. These antennas are separated by a distance r. I treat this one like a point source. I need to figure out how much power is radiating away in this direction. Well. I know, if I know what the gain is of my transmitter in that particular direction, then it's actually very easy, right? I say that my pointing vector, the magnitude of it at least, I don't really care about the direction at this point, the magnitude of that pointing vector is going to be the energy density of an isotropic radiator, which is PT over 4 pi r squared times g sub t, because that was our definition. g sub t is how much or how, how much positive or negative gain are you getting. It could be a value greater than 1 or net less than 1 with respect to an isotropic radiator. This will give me, in total, watts per meter squared, and will tell me how much energy is washing, the, ener the power density washing over this received antenna. If I want P sub R, all I have to do is say, here's the effective aperture, A, E sub M, like we did in the previous example problem. I multiply that by my energy density, S av. And that gives me watts per meter squared times meter squared watts. That'll tell me how many watts are coming out of the spigot of that antenna. We said that A, E sub M is actually lambda squared times my receive gain over 4 pi. And my S av, I have a, an expression up here, P sub t, G sub t, over 4 pi r squared. So this is from the definition relating a electromagnetic aperture to receive gain. This is from just uh, my definition of transmit gain with respect to an isotropic radiator. Put them together and we have the Friss free space equation for transmission of power. P sub R is equal to P sub T Transmit antenna gain, receive antenna gain. Both of these will be functions of orientation. If I change the orientations of the antennas with respect to one another, I get different answers. I've got a net la lambda squared 
over 4 pi r quantity squared. r is the separation distance. Power falls off 1 over r squared. It can be affected by your antenna gains. It's a function of frequency or wavelength in this case, the same thing. Frequency is going to vary 1 over wavelength. And it varies linearly with the amount of power that you put into the transmit antenna. One of the most important equations in anything related to radio or optics, the Frisk free space equation. And it's in, a, it's in a very convenient format that doesn't involve field strength now. It simply involve power, involves powers. And these quantities that are called gains, which are very easily, this is what you put, put out of your antenna spec sheet. If you buy an antenna online, you look at the spec sheet, and it'll give you the actual gain patterns. Those are the numbers that you put into the Frisk free space equation here and here. The rest is just physics and geometry. Any questions so far? Perfect understanding? It's not that hard. You've probably seen a form of this. We're, we're going to use this and develop it into a practical form to a degree that you probably have not seen. Let's see. I don't want to write with that bar in front of me. I was wondering why I never used that backboard. That's why. Okay, so I have a question for you. And it's about the behavior of the Frisk free space equation. And it basically tells you the regime that we satellite engineers like to operate under. Okay, Frisk free space transmission equation to repeat again is... Transmit power times transmit gain times receiver gain lambda squared over 4 pi r squared. <coughs> okay. And remember, gain can be defined as 4 pi times the electromagnetic aperture over lambda squared. Now, in the first free space equation, in my mind, I like to, to think of this as actually three different equations, or three different scenarios that you operate under. So, here's a, here's a question. How much gain does your cell phone antenna have? If you wanted to make an estimate of the gain of your cell phone antenna, what number would you plug into this formula? trying to track power from base station to uh, your Angry Birds terminal. Just, just guess a number. 1.23, yeah. It was, uh, it was like a kind of a dipolish thing. I, when, when I do just rough back of the envelope estimates, I use the value 1. 1. Why? Because you want your antenna at your handset to be an isotropic radiator. That's actually the best case scenario, right? Because it's got to receive power from every direction, right? I don't want to get really high peak gain on a cell phone antenna because at the end of the day, an antenna is not an active device. It's connected to active devices, but the antenna itself is just a hunk of metal. It doesn't actually give any gain. It doesn't add power to your system. It just efficiently collects power in some directions more than in other directions. If I'm getting gain at one direction, by necessity, that must be at the expense of other directions in space. So if I want a good cell phone, I need to basically spread the wealth. I need gain in all the directions. I can't have gain greater than one in all the directions. So one is the best I can do. When I integrate gain over 4 pi star radians, average it over 4 pi star radians, I'm going to get a number that's less than or equal to one, unless I have a really funny-looking antenna on it that has active devices on it that's smuggling in power that I'm not aware of. Right? Everybody understand that idea? Uh, uh, an antenna is not... Uh, uh, 
It's, it's, a, it's a bicycle. It's not a car. Bicycle, you only get the energy in, out of it that you put into it. A car, you put a little energy into the gas pedal, and then, of course, it surges forward because it's like a big amplifier. And by necessity, that means that if I want coverage in all directions, my gain is going to be less than or equal to one. It turns out, mathematically, you can't even build an isotropic antenna for a fixed polarization. So there's a lot of people that try to get kind of close and approximate it and twist polarization around or try to play around with the pattern. But for the most part, a gain of one or zero dBi is the value that you would typically use for uh, an antenna gain. Okay. So, given that in keeping that in mind, if gain is equal to one, then you have a broadcast to broadcast link. I have a transmitter that has a gain of one, unit one, linear one, and a receive antenna that has a, uh, an antenna of, of a gain of one as well. And in that scenario, what I'm saying is that I have a transmitter and a receiver. They don't know where each other is. And so they need to transmit. The transmitter needs to broadcast its power all over the creation. And the receiver needs to receive in any direction because it doesn't know where the signal's coming from. And if that's the case, then that first free space transmission equation takes a particular form where G sub T is equal to 1 and G sub R is equal to 1. Tell me, how does this link behave with frequency? Do you want higher frequency or lower frequency if you're concerned about the amount of power? You want lower frequency. There's a lambda squared in the numerator because lambda is inversely proportional to frequency. That means as I go up in frequency, I get lossier when I exchange power between two antennas. If I keep everything else the same, transmit power, separation distance, double the frequency, quadruple the loss, you get a penalty for operating at higher frequencies. This is why all the broadcast stuff, broadcast television, FM radio, AM radio, that's all at the bottom end of the frequency spectrum. It wasn't just the fact that you know, we couldn't build electronics at high frequencies, so they wound up, those early applications wound up populating the lower frequency. That's part of the reason. It was actually beneficial to get down there below UHF, or UHF or below, to actually do broadcast to broadcast type applications. Now, what if you have the freedom to point your aperture? or vice versa. Let's say one of my antennas now has a sizable amount of aperture, which means I can get gain greater than one in a particular direction. However, that will come at the expense of the other directions. I have my peak gain grows in this direction. That means I'm robbing Peter to pay Paul. I'm taking all my efficient radiation or an absorption of radiation in all these other directions to feed my peak gain. If that's the case, then if I look at my first free space equation, one of those terms, g sub r or g sub t, one of those is going to be equal to 1, and I'm left with an electromagnetic aperture, which is 4, which I can plug in gain is equal to 4 pi electromagnetic aperture over lambda squared. That's going to cancel by one of the uh, lambda squares up there and one of the 4 pi's down here, so it becomes 4 pi r squared. 
So I got an antenna that's this big, roughly, A, A E sub M in meters squared. I transmit power to, or I receive from it. I can use the transmitter or the receiver. If the other thing is broadcasting, this is how much link power I have in the link. Do you notice a frequency dependence? No. No. Nope. It cancels. Whatever I lose in the free, free space equation in terms of extra frequency loss, I gain by the fact that an aperture can be made more directional, get higher gain as I go up in frequency. If I don't change the size, the gain goes up. So you'll find that those dishes on the top of Van Leer, for example, if I operate them on the low end of, this, of their rated use, they get one gain. If I double the frequency, the gain will go up by a factor of four, or six dB in the logarithmic scale. Because that, for that same fixed aperture size, I can get more gain because it's really the size relative to a wavelength that determines gain. And this is a wash in terms of frequency. Point to point, and this is critical for satellite communications, I have an area of my transmitter antenna and a, an effective aperture area for my receiver antenna. And I will pick up a lambda squared and lose a 4 pi if I plug in my aperture formulas instead of the gain values into the Frisk free space equation. This is important. Now, if I have the freedom, if I have two electromagnetically large antennas and I have the freedom to point them to one another, the Frisk free space equation says that I will get 1 over lambda squared dependence on path loss. As I go up in frequency, my link gets less lossy. So if I have for a fixed amount of aperture, I want to operate as high a frequency as I can. The only thing limiting me is, well, there might be a couple things. First of all, my electronics may not work very, only up to a certain point. Um, I may be limited uh, also by just the ability to point the antenna. I don't want to make the beam so thin that, because we're going to learn in a, in a little bit that there's a relationship between beam width and peak gain. If I get a really big peak gain, my beam width is getting thinner and thinner. And at some point, it just becomes hard to do the handshake, right? you got to point two antennas with one another. If one of those antennas is out in outer space, it's actually kind of tricky to do that pointing operation. So you don't want to make it too thin. And then I may also be uh, limited by things like atmospheric losses. In fact, that's usually what puts a damper on the highest frequency we use as satellite engineers, the fact that we run into gas absorption lines of oxygen and nitrogen as we go up into the 60 and 70 gigahertz and beyond. Otherwise, we would love to use terahertz, right, because we have this formula that we are usually operating in in the satellite community that says higher is better. And so that's why satellite users have been using millimeter waves for decades. And now people are just kind of talking about using them in the terrestrial wireless environment. Well, why? But they've got a broadcast. They've got issues with multipath and all this stuff. They don't want to deal with millimeter waves. But it was really how to make a lot of these long distance spacecraft links work for the satellite community. I had developed on the board a way to track power in an RF system that doesn't require E's and H's, the field theory to track power. E's and H's are important. And in fact, we gave a set of equations last time that allow you to trans transfer between E's and H's, right? If I give you an E, you can pretty much feel, figure out what the H and the power is using the pointing vector. You can kind of reverse engineer that calculation. If I just give you a power, you can figure out what combination of E and H. They always appear with a ratio of 377 ohms in free space. And you can actually back solve the field quantities. But RF engineers like to use power. Power is simple. Power is often the showstopper in communications anyway. Uh, and it's also the the spec that you get off of spec sheets when you deal with antennas. You don't get E's and H's and other complicated parameters, you get gain. Uh, when you get a transmit amplifier, you don't get voltages and currents, typically, off of the, the output. 
you get a power, a maximum power before it starts to compress. Uh, you can calculate all that stuff, but for, for straightforward calculation, it's really power that we like to work with. And I put on the board the Friss free space transmission equation. This tracks the amount of power I can get from antenna A to antenna B, a transmit antenna to a receive antenna. So this is received power in watts. Transmit power also in watts. And some people can even use milliwatts as long as you're consistent on both sides. Of course, it doesn't matter. A transmit antenna gain and a receive antenna gain. This is going to be a function of orientation. It's also going to be a function of polarization. If I have two dipoles that are aligned with one another, they'll, you'll maximize their gains from transmit to receive. Even if the same gain is uh, radiation gain is experienced at that same orientation, if I were to turn the dipoles like this, I would get cross-polarization mismatch, and I would not get any signal power in the worst case transmitted. So keep in mind that we don't have anything to take into account polarization gain. That's often used, uh, or losses, that's often used as a, uh, another term that you add on to the link budget. This assumes that everything is kind of aligned perfectly with respect to polarization. Sometimes gains actually include the polarization losses if, if you're kind of working with a specific uh, type of receiver, for example, a receive antenna. For example, you may uh, buy an antenna that has several different gain patterns. It'll talk about the vertical gain, vertical polarization gain, horizontal polarization gain, gain when read by a circular polarization antenna. So just be aware that there's that aspect. We're going to delve just a little bit into polarization because it is important to satellite engineers, but we're not going to exhaustively analyze it. Yeah? Uh, when you say polarization, you mean the orientation of the H and the H field? That's exactly right. The orientation of the E and the H field. So you can have linear polarization, and of course that can point any direction. And you also have things like circular polarization, elliptical polarization, where the E field is actually spinning around, and the H field, of course, as well. And there are ways, we'll tell you later how to track that in a little bit. But for now, <clears throat> let's assume everything, there is no polarization mismatch, and we can take these gains as, uh, as a given in the problem. Let's see, there should be a 4 pi r squared in the denominator. R is the transmit-receive separation distance in meters, if you're using SI units, as this equation should. And we need a lambda squared, which is wavelength also in meters. So at the end of the day, this should be a unitless quantity. We got meters squared, meters squared gains are, are unitless the way that they're defined in antenna engineering, as all gains are. <coughs> and this is it. This is the Frisk free space equation. And we ended the le uh, last set of lectures on this last time by saying there are basically three regimes of the first free space equation. There's my broadcasting um, isotropic antenna form, where these gains are almost approximately one. In fact, they could be a little bit less than one in a realistic scenario. Gains are never greater than one when averaged over four pi star radius, because that means you're smuggling power into your antenna that's not physically possible. If you get a gain of grain at if you get a gain greater than one in one direction, you have to necessarily take it away from the other directions because an antenna is just a hunk of metal. It's got to satisfy conservation of power. And by reciprocity, that holds for transmission and reception. So there's the case where these are approximately equal to one. That's for electrically small antennas that receive roughly the same in every direction. <coughs> 
And if that's the case, we notice the lambda squared term in the numerator, which means there's going to be a 1 over f squared, 1 over frequency squared relationship in the denominator that smuggles in that frequency dependent. And that means our links get much lossier as we go to higher and higher frequency. It's more difficult to broadcast information at higher frequencies with electrically small antennas. This is why all the broadcast applications that you know, if you look at the FCC chart in Amer America, all that stuff is at the low frequency application. FM radio, AM radio, uh, VHF television, the lower UHF bands of, of broadcast television. Why? Because you just need to blast the power out all, all across creation and you stick your little whip antenna up and try to receive it in your car or at your home. Um, and you don't know where a priori the signal is coming from. Not true if you have the freedom to point one of these. Remember we said last time that gain is actually equal to your electromagnetic aperture, 4 pi over times the electromagnetic aperture over wavelength squared. So if you have physical size to your antenna that you're allowed to focus energy with and get gain, then if you insert this once into the first free space equation, that cancels the lambda squared, and you get a, a link that's somewhat independent of frequency. This would be, most commonly, your UHF and lower microwave bands. This is why we use these for personal communications, um, because there's at least a little insensitivity to um, uh, the link loss with respect to frequency. Why? Because you've got an aperture at the base station antenna. You've seen base station antennas before, right? They're kind of these big, tall things that actually use aperture to force the beam down along the horizon, and they're usually sectorized as well. And so these guys get gain as you go up in frequency for a fixed aperture, which means as you bump up the frequency, if you keep your base station antenna the same size, then at least approximately you get some of that gain back that you lose with respect to frequency. Of course, the antennas at your handset, they have to be able to receive from every direction because you never know exactly how you're going to have your conversation. You could be laying on your bed or you're standing up and jumping around on one foot. Who knows? It's got to work in all those cases, right? So, so in that scenario, it's almost a wash. You can use the middle of the band. And of course, our satellite engineers... We like the case where both antennas are big apertures that we can point. Why? Because I get 1 over lambda squared in one gain, 1 over lambda squared in another gain. That cancels this and puts an additional lambda squared in the denominator, which means my received power goes up as frequency squared for two fixed aperture sizes exchanging energy. I have to be able to point them. I have to know a priori where they are, However, the beauty of satellite engineering is that we keep careful track of our satellites, particularly the geostationary Earth orbit ones. Those are really easy. They're always in the exact same point in the sky. So you can hammer in a dish down in, into your backyard. There's a directional antenna on the satellite TV broadcaster or whatever is broadcasting from geostationary Earth orbit, and you can have a really nice, robust link. We need that gain because unlike... The cellular people, where R is only a kilometer or two, sometimes less, our R's are thousands of kilometers. Remember, this has to be in meters. So if I'm in low Earth orbit, I might have a million meters to square in the denominator. That's going to lead to a lot of loss. If I'm geostationary Earth orbit, that's going to be like 36,000 meters that I have to square and overcome the, the spatial spreading loss. So we need that. And that's why you'll find that satellite engineers in general use the upper microwave band and even the millimeter wave band because we need those gains. We would go even higher if we could, but unfortunately the atmosphere, the water vapor, the nitrogen, and the oxygen start to absorb RF. It's interesting that there are basically – Two windows of radiation. You kind of take this for granted, but there are two windows of radiation through the atmosphere. One is optical. That's why the sun shines down to Earth. And uh, the other one is at RF. Above 60 gigahertz, 
and below the optical frequencies that you see with your eyes, the atmosphere is very opaque, particularly at some atmospheric resonances. It would just like, look like a gray, dark cloud if you could see at low frequency. If you could see at infrared, the sun would never shine. You'd just see this dreary. It would be like Seattle all the time. So. Okay, so that's our, our linear. And this is called the Friss free space transmission equation. I, I, I pronounce this first. I was in a room full of people that do antennas for a living with 30 years' experience each in, in them at the standards committee. And every one of them had a different way to pronounce this. this uh, the free, the free uh, one guy from Australia was even calling it the Fry equation. So it turns out first is a Danish researcher, and uh, I looked this up. It's actually the Frege kind of a J at the end if you really want to be particular. Most people would say the free or the Friss equation in English. It's a little side note. Does anybody speak Danish here? Anybody with Danish ancestry can straighten us out? No, I ask that question in every single one of my lectures. One thing I've realized is that Danes never come to Georgia Tech. I think it's kind of sad. Okay. Now, let me teach you an alternate form for this equation that's probably even a little bit more useful. One of the interesting things about RF is that the quantities that you deal with are so incredibly disparate from one another that uh, we like to put them in the logarithmic scale, right? Why? Because you'll find uh, uh, your FM radio tower may be sending out hundreds of kilowatts of power. You may be pumping tens or hundreds of kilowatts of power into your FM radio. At a receiver, we can very easily receive a signal down in the pico or even femtowatts in some. So that's, what, what did I just cover? That was like 10 to the 5th and 10 to the minus um, 14, 13, something like that. That's like, that's like almost 20 orders of magnitude. That's why we need the dB scale. So by the end of this class, you'll be thinking in dB. Of course, the dB scale, we take 10 log base 10, our physical quantity, and that puts it in the dB scale. The physical quantity in this case should be unitless, okay? Now, there are a couple exceptions when we get into RF engineering. If you take 10 log base 10 of a power value, for example, received value, those units are now dB, and we put a capital W for watts. So uh, a lot of people will use logarithmic power. Gains you're prob you've probably seen before. Everybody's probably seen that in the form of dB. You take 10 log 10, the power gain. Sometimes you take 20 log 10 if you're dealing with voltage gain or current gain. Why? Because power is always proportional to voltage squared or current squared. So you've got to use 20 instead of 10. I went to my entire undergraduate career without ever figuring out, out that. Like my... my Sometimes my professors were taking 10 log 10 to put it in the dB scale. Sometimes they were taking 20 log 10. And it just seems like they were being capricious about it. It's like, oh, it's Tuesday. Let's take 20 log 10. <laughs> no, that's not the case. You do 10 when, you are, when we're dealing with power, so all of our values will be 10 log 10. Okay, so that's dBW. Sometimes, if instead of watts, you put milliwatts in here, that's a very common metric of power in RF engineering as well. And that's dBm. dB immediately followed by a little m for milliwatts. And the preference, I mean, it's already in the logarithmic scale, so you're not really doing anything dramatic by uh, shifting. These are always uh, 30 dB from one another. You subtract 30 from this to get to here. You add 30 from this to get to here. As a rule of thumb, if you're talking about transmit powers, quite often you'll use dBw's. And when you talk about received powers, you use dBm's. But that's not a hard and fast rule by any stretch of the imagination. So just be prepared to work a problem with both, either of those. Okay. And one more thing. When you take 10 log base 10, an antenna gain, for example, this has units of dBi. The little i means isotropic. Why? Because that's how we define gain. It's decibel gain with respect to an isotropic radiator. That's how we built up the link budget last class period. It is actually possible 
First of all, antenna gains are always referenced against something. In this class, we will always reference it against an isotropic radiator. 95% of most textbooks and papers do the same thing. There's still, especially in some archaic literature, uh, people that reference things against a dipole, for example, which has a little gain, which means those values are actually smaller. So you'll see db little d instead of little i. So be aware that that convention exists as well. You may never see it in your professional lifetime, but who knows? I've seen it a, one, a few times, and it's a little confusing. Okay, so now let's do the logarithmic link budget of the first free space equation. We do that by taking 10 log base 10 of every term, each side of the first free space equation. So that becomes power received in dBW or dBm. I just have to be consistent on both sides, is equal to 10 log base 10, the other side. Now, I have a bunch of terms multiplied together. And the nice thing about logarithms is that when I take 10 log 10 something, it's really like adding 10 log 10 each of those individual terms. And so all I have to do is add each individual logarithmic term. So I have a transmit power either in dBW or dBm. I just need to be consistent. I have to add an antenna gain, and of course this is in dBi. That's more commonly, very rarely does a spec sheet ever give you an antenna gain in linear scale. It usually gives it in dBi, just to be, on, just to be aware as you go out and practice. dBi for your receiver gain. And then let's see, what else do I have? I have plus 20 log 10 of lambda over 4 pi. Why 20? Because each of these terms is squared in that equation. And then I also have minus 20. Why minus 20? Well, this is going to be my log 10 r. 20 because r is squared and minus is because it's in the denominator and I've flipped it up to the numerator. I can do that by flipping the sign of the logarithm. Does everybody, everybody tracking me so far? Perfect understanding? So this is our form. And in fact, these terms have different names. This is often called the path loss at one meter free space. And over here, we have path loss with respect to one meter free space. Collectively, this is our path loss. This is due to the hardware that we connect to our system, our transmit power, whatever device we've connected to the transmit antenna, that will have an output power. We have our transmit antenna. We have our receiver antenna. And then we have uh, the re anything else is called path loss in the link budget equation. Because we have a free space link, there is no path loss other than the path loss for the signal to go one meter, and then the path loss for it to go anywhere beyond that. The nice, reason, the nice reason for grouping terms this way is because when you go to take measurements, this term is, has all the frequency dependence in it, right? This is how RF engineers like to think about the problem. You got a certain frequency, you experience a certain loss to one meter free space, and that includes your frequency dependence. Anything beyond that, this term, including any losses that might occur, is your path loss with respect to one meter free space. And if you characterize that and model that in your uh, environment for a particular frequency, you can adjust the frequency plus or minus, usually half a decade, and still get reasonable estimates of power. So, for example, what, what, what I mean by that, well, let's say I have um, a 2.4 gigahertz access point. It's somewhere in this building, and I'm measuring the signal strength. I know it's 30 meters away. And so I figure out what the path loss at one meter free space is for that device. And then I subtract whatever additional losses I measure on there. So now I have a dB path loss with respect to one meter free space. If I decide that I'm going to try to do wireless networking at 3.2 gigahertz, I think there would probably, probably be something that would make, get me arrested if I did that in that band. But just to say for our sake of argument, 
that's really not that far away in terms of orders of magnitude from 2.4. So I can actually, with a degree of impunity, use that same path loss with respect to free space measurement, go back and adjust my frequency dependent term, plop in this term here, figure out what my gains are and my transmit powers are for the antennas and transmitters that I'm using, and get a really good link estimate of the power. So that's the reason why RF engineers like to break this stuff up into those particular terms, this frequency dependent one meter term, and then all the stuff that comes after it. In our initial study of the link budget, we'll just worry about the spatial spreading of losses. And then we'll add some other terms later in the class uh, that deal with things like atmospheric attenuation or rain attenuation, uh, cloud attenuation, and the other things that happen to our, uh, satellite signals. And of course, if you're doing mobile satellite telephony or something like that, then you can have buildings in the way, you can be indoors, you get all these extra losses that you have to tabulate as well. We're not going to go into that level of detail, but just recognize that this equation is very easy to modify to put additional blockage losses on there. And most of the papers that you read in textbooks, if you do encounter that problem, will have additional losses with respect to the logarithmic link budget that you can very easily plug from tables into this equation. <coughs> so enough talking about the logarithmic link budget. We need to work some examples. And one more note about this equation, though. Sometimes you will see this equation in a slightly different form. For example, if you're given a, a, an earth station or a transmitter antenna assembly that's kind of sold as a package, they may not report these two things separately. It is not uncommon to combine them into a term called effective isotropic radiated power, or EIRP. EIRP has units of either DBMs or DBWs in this equation, and that's one thing that you're going to have to get used to because we're in the logarithmic scale. Unit analysis doesn't work the same as it typically does in the linear scale. So if you take DBWs and you add DBIs, you get DBWs. DBI is a unitless quantity in the linear scale, so it preserves the unit. That can be kind of confusing the first time you see it. But EIRP is basically what, what is the power that I would have to put into an isotropic antenna to get it to radiate like this collective system. And so it, it generally looks like a much inflated number compared to what's actually being transmitted, right? And you see this all the time, especially in like radio stations, like an FM radio station. I don't know, have, how many of you, <laughs> this is the, the year 2015, does anyone li listen to FM radio anymore? A few people? Yeah. Sports, sports broadcasts, I guess, maybe, I don't know. A few of you driving, driving around. Well, have you ever noticed that uh, some FM radio stations like to brag about the amount of power that they're transmitting? They like to say things like, blasting over Atlanta with one megawatt of power, WBAD. You know, that makes them sound really cool, right? Well, usually to make their numbers inflating seem uh, a little more inflated, they're actually quoting EIRP. They're not actually quoting the power into this, their transmit. Because you think about it, you put an, um, you're blasting a megawatt over Atlanta. Like, should, you be, should we all be walking around in aluminum suits? It's, it sounds a little scary, right? They say, no, actually, that they've got this array of antennas on their FM tower that gives them 16 dBi of gain. And that means that they're really only putting in about maybe, I don't know, two, two and a half uh, kilowatts, also known as, I don't know, 25 light bulbs worth of power. That's, that's really not that much to have up on a giant pole and blasting over the entire city. But it sounds so much more impressive when you report EIRP in the linear scale like that. Okay. So I have a couple examples with numbers just to put numbers into the 
the mix example number one so that we get comfortable using these terms Example one, a geostationary Earth orbit satellite transmits a video signal at 11 gigahertz. So the carrier is on 11 gigahertz. Um, with one kilowatt of power. The transmit antenna has gain of 12 dBi Assuming no atmospheric losses, estimate the received power from a 35 dBi dish antenna at the Earth station. Okay, so here's the scenario. We've got a geostationary Earth orbit satellite. So automatically, we know that that's going to be approximately, if it's directly overhead, 36,000 kilometers. And remember, we're using SI units, so that has to be plugged into the equation as 36 million meters. Now, it could be a little bit to the right or to the left, and so this might go up a little bit, but... We're just doing a board analysis, and it turns out it's not going to change the answer that much once you get that far away. Okay, that's their distance because it's geostationary Earth orbit. It's also at 11 gigahertz. This is actually the common uh, center frequency for satellite television bands, very close to this. The lambda, the wavelength that we need in the equation, is going to be the speed of light divided by the frequency. That's 3.0 E8 divided by 11 E9. Our wavelength is all the way down to about 0 0.027 meters, about an inch, about that big. That's how long the, it takes, how much the signal travels in space to experience one phase change in a wave. Okay, and to use our logarithmic link budget, luckily, Professor Durgan has given you some typical values that are already in the dB scale. Transmit antenna gain of 12 dBi and a dish gain pointed at the satellite at 35 dBi. Here's a quick question. Why in this representative, semi-typical link with realistic numbers that I've put in, would the video transmission antenna, the transmit antenna gain, be so much smaller in the receiver antenna gain. So it's 35 dBi. Remember, that's in the logarithmic scale, so that's like, uh, uh, you know, over, well over 1,000. Did you have an it? Yeah. Because uh, the transmit antenna has to be on the satellite carried up in space, where it's ever much bigger. Yeah, that's, that's one, one reason. You don't want a really big, bulky antenna on your spacecraft, because it costs a lot of money to launch mass up there. Now, keep in mind, though, that this 35 dBi of gain at 12 gigahertz when the, or 11 gigahertz when the wavelength is that small, it doesn't need a very large mass. The satellite is bigger than the antenna in the Earth station that would actually receive with that much gain. Yes? 
Is it because you're receiving leads already generated, so it has to absorb more? Like what else? That's true. We need, we definitely need the antenna gains because we've, we've gotten, there's no way to get the signal to noise ratio to do communications with this link otherwise. You can't just put dipoles out. That's true. Now, that still doesn't answer the question, why is the big gain at the earth station and not at the tr satellite? Because by reciprocity, we could have reversed this, right? We could have gotten all of our gain at the satellite and put little dinky antennas out to receive power at the earth station. So you're thinking what right, but there's actually another reason that we have to consider. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say that you can work on the ground station because you, you can point it directly at the satellite, whereas the satellite has to point at the whole. That's that's exactly the whole, yeah. uh, region. That's, that's right. It's a coverage issue. It's a coverage issue. The the satellite dish on the Earth is trying to get a signal from one satellite up in geostationary Earth orbit. And in fact, not only do you need the gain to get the signal energy up. You also need the gain because that makes an antenna that has a very thin beam, plus or minus two degrees, that spatially rejects anything that's in that same band along geostationary Earth orbit. It's only carried, it wants to pick out one signal at 11 gigahertz at a specific point in the sky. You need high gain to get that little thin beam width and reject all of the other signals. Contrast that to the satellite, which really needs to cover all of North America in this instance, if this is a transmission satellite. And so it can't get more than a certain threshold of gain. Otherwise, the coverage starts to squint up and you're not covering one or more of the coasts. And that ticks off a lot of customers because that's where the most of the customers live, on the coasts. The people in Nebraska are going to be happy no matter what, but... You're going to get the, the brunt of coverage. That's actually not true. We've gotten so good at designing arrays and antennas that there are special antenna designs that you put on um, the satellite that have sort of a population and geographic weighted uh, gain pattern that matches the shape of the United States. Uh, it's really cool. Uh, so, you know, you can actually, like, increase your gain for the north, northern climbs of uh, the United States, up at northern latitudes, so that you give a little extra dB or two to them because you've got to travel a little bit more and experience a little more path loss. Or for, in the case of direct TV satellite, we're getting high enough where rain attenuation actually affects the propagation. And so there are some um, antenna patterns that like shoot an extra dB or two down to Georgia and Florida because we get more rain than the rest of the country on average and we need the gain. And then, you know, maybe throws a little up at uh, the eastern U.S. Interestingly, even though it rains, I was just busting earlier in, on Seattle and some of the west coast, northwestern Pacific states. Even though it's cloudy and it rains most of the time, you don't get like the thunderstorms or the deluges that you get here in Atlanta. And so you find you don't need as much. The raindrops are smaller and more sparse, even though it's all the time. Sometimes it feels like. So there are many different effects that you have to, we'll, we'll talk about these later. Okay, so we have a transmit antenna gain that's small because we have to broadcast. We have a high receive gain because we have a um, a fixed dish receiver antenna that needs to do spatial multiplexing with the signal it's trying to pick out in the sky. The only thing that's not in dB is this one kilowatt. That's easy enough. That would be 30 dBW when it's placed in the logarithmic scale. So now we have everything that we need to calculate this problem. Receive power should be 30 dBW, plus my antenna gains. Uh, let's see, plus 20 log 10. Uh, 0 0.027 over 4 pi minus 20 log 10 of the distance 
36 million. And what do we achieve? What is the answer here? Here it is. The magic professor calculator, where everything is calculated ahead of time. We get negative. Here, I'll write it on the next board since I'm probably getting a little bit too low to see. The receive power, when I add up all those numbers, is negative 127 dBW. That would be, in the linear scale, 2 times 10 to the negative 3, 13 watts. Or, if you wanted to, neg 97 dBm, decibel milliwatts. Tomato, tomato, doesn't matter. It's the same thing. So look at that. That's an incredibly tiny amount of power. Let's see, we're in the, the femtowatts, aren't we? So let's see, 10 to the minus 9 is nanowatt. 10 to the minus 12 is picowatt. And we're dealing with 200 femtowatts, if I remember my tiny little units correctly. Isn't that incredible that these systems work down that? Your cell phone can receive the signal and operate a voice channel at neg 97 dBm. You can have a conversation. Femtowatts. This is why we need the dB scale. You'll be thinking in dB by the time you're into this class. You'll be going to the grocery store. And you'll be shopping on the canned goods aisle. And you say, well, this can is 75% off. That's 60 dB off. Okay, any questions about this example? Let's do another one just to get a feel for these numbers again. And this time, let's do a deep space mission. Because remember, we haven't even left Earth. This is geostationary Earth orbit, 36 million mile, uh, meters away. But there are much farther links that we've done radio communications with. What might one of those look like? Okay, example two, a deep space link. Now here's our problem. Mars, at a particular point in time, is 100 million kilometers from Earth. A rover on Mars, let's say, transmits a 40 gigahertz signal from a dish pointed back to Earth with 52 dBi of gain. That's a lot of gain, but it's actually very easy to get at 40 gigahertz because the wavelength is so small. You're talking about a wavelength that's less than a centimeter at this point. So you can get an electromagnetically large dish that isn't that physically large that you can actually send to Mars without breaking the budget. And of course on Earth, We can have an even larger antenna because we have the luxury of building a huge antenna in, as part of NASA's deep space network. So this might be one of the dishes on their deep space network. NASA actually maintains several points around the globe, North America, uh, Australia, Europe, a few other sites. So that basically, regardless of where the Earth is in its rotation, uh, there's always some big network of super-sensitive dishes that can point towards 
the planet or the spacecraft or the moon or wherever the science mission is happening and pull data back. And so this is one of those big, luxurious antennas, 60 dBi. If the receiver requires a minimum sensitivity of neg-150 dBW, what is the required transmit power? So we need neg-150 dBW. It's really not that far apart from the example that we just calculated. This is about maybe 200 times less power than the satellite TV broadcast that we just analyzed. Well, keep in mind that this is still going to be hard to get because we're going 100 billion meters, not 36 million meters. So that's going to add a lot of extra spatial loss to the problem. So we have to cut back and expect to operate with less overall power. Now, it turns out that's possible. You just have to use a narrower band signal where there's less or, or some fancy processing where you can reject more noise. In other words, you've got to slow down your real data rate to transmit the, this power level. This is why we don't stream high-definition video from Mars. First of all, it's kind of boring. You see rocks everywhere. And secondly, I guess it would compress well, so maybe we could do that. I don't know. But... Uh, you know, it, it, we're really just downloading GIFs on dial-up from Mars. This is effectively what we're doing. Uh, very slow images from uh, whatever camera or scientific instrument that we've placed on the rovers. So, let's figure out how much do we actually need to transmit that. If we're in the ballpark of a few hundred watts, that's probably doable. We could probably drive that with solar cells on Mars. If we get much, much more than 100 or so watts, then we're in trouble because it's hard to get power to Mars. Where Mars is a good bit farther away from Earth, so I forget the exact statistic. It might be like a quarter of the solar power available during the Martian day compared to high noon on Earth. So we have to be very conscientious of our power. And if it takes, two, if it takes 100 watts to tran of transmit power, keep in mind that the hardware to drive that RF equipment is probably expending 200 watts or 300 watts, depending on how you've designed it. So let's calculate this. Okay. Rearranging the logarithmic link budget equation, I'm going to swap received power for transmit power and negate the term. So I'm going to start with received power, and I'm going to subtract off the gains of the antennas in dBi, subtract off my reference path loss, and then add my spatial spreading, log r. So here's my transmit path loss. Here's my receiver path loss. Really, if I just take all of this and put it on this side of the equation, I have my classical link budget equation where I'm calculating received power from all the transmitter specs. Since this question is asking for transmit power, I just rearrange it into this form. What did we say this was? Uh, received power, we need at least neg 150 dBW. This was 50. 2 dBi, the rover's antenna gain. This is the deep space network antenna gain for the frequency and dish that we've chosen. What is lambda? It's actually 7.5 times 10 to the negative third meters, about 7 millimeters. And, of course, this is 100 times 10 to the ninth meters. So... Plug this into the Magic Professor calculator where everything is calculated ahead of time. And this comes out to be 22.4 dBWs. 
Is that a workable number for a space mission? Well, in this case, it's easier to put it back into physical units of watts. How do I do that? I raise 10 to the 22.4 divided by 10, and that gives me the watts. That winds up being 174 watts. Probably doable. I need to send that much power into my antenna to get this signal with the minimum fidelity requirements back to Earth. Final answer.